Welcome to another seminar series from the Blue Mountain Natural Resources Institute. I'm the Institute Manager, Larry Hartman. The Blue Mountains Natural Resources Institute is a part of the Pacific Northwest Station of Forest Service Research and is also funded by the Pacific Northwest region of the National Forest System. Our territory includes all of the Blue Mountains, including 10 counties in Oregon and four counties in Washington. The Institute achieves its success by working with its partners, which include federal, state, tribal, and local government agencies, as well as industry, environmental organizations, private landowners, and educational institutions. The Institute does three main types of activities. First, we offer educational activities and technology transfer, including seminars like this one. And we do research management tours, publications, videos, and we even sponsor conferences. Second, we conduct applied research, which is designed to meet real-world resource management problems. Third, the Institute serves as a neutral forum for discussing environmental issues so that people or organizations with differing opinions can get to understand one another better. This presentation exemplifies the Institute's goal, putting science to work. It's part of our ongoing commitment to bring science results to resource managers and to the general public. This seminar series is entitled Cottonwood and Aspen, Managing for Balance, Ecology, and Management, which examines the importance of cottonwood and aspen as components of ecosystem diversity. The last of the three sessions features speakers that discuss three subjects, cottonwood and aspen, economics and management, cottonwood and aspen management, and cottonwoods on eastern Oregon farms and ranches. I hope you find it interesting. This evening, uh, our first presenter will be Paul Esther. Paul has a, a bachelor's uh, degree from in forest management at OSU. He has a master's of a master of science degree in forest entomology from OSU. Paul is an extension uh, forester. He's been with uh, the OSU Extension Service since 1980. He was originally in Coquille, and now he's been in Lagrand for a number of years. And Paul will address economics and general management of cottonwood. Second speaker is, second speaker is Otis Lari. Uh, Otis uh, has a degree in engineering from Heinz Junior College in Mississippi and a degree in forestry from uh, Mississippi State University. Uh, Otis has been with the federal government for 29 years. He's a silviculturist with a BLM with an emphasis in fire ecology and reforestation. Otis will address the function of, function of cottonwood and aspen management and economics from a federal viewpoint. Rick Wagner is a third presenter, and Rick has a Bachelor of Science degree in forestry from OSU. He graduated in 1979. He's been a forest practices forester for the Oregon Department of Forestry in Northeast Oregon uh, since that time. He's a co-leader on uh, the ODFW, ODF Cottonwood, education project and Rick uh, is also a member of the uh, Union County rescue search and rescue uh, team and he was called out to this this week to help find a, one of our good uh, friends uh, Roberta Bates in the in the watershed up here in the Legrand watershed so thanks for that Rick uh, Rick will address cottonwoods on eastern Oregon farms and ranches and with that, we'll have Paul Esther come up and uh, begin his presentation. Thank you, Bill. I'm going to talk about cottonwood and aspen economics and management from a, the perspective of the private landowner, as Bill said. And my objectives of this pre presentation are to help people understand the basic concepts of selling aspen and cottonwood, and to help folks get a, uh, some idea of some general management guidelines for healthy stands. <coughs> I think the first 
thing uh, most landowners are going to ask themselves is why am I have why am I doing this harvest? And I put down a few ideas here. Uh, there are probably others, but generally, uh, you might think in terms of uh, what kind of income am I going to get from this harvest? And hopefully, I'm I'm going to make a profit. Am I going to improve the health of an existing stand? You may have a stand that's uh, been damaged from wind or ice or something like that, and you might consider going in, sanitizing it, thinning it, cleaning it up. And you might want to convert a healthy, uh, convert a stand that's decadent to a healthy new stand, or create habitat for specific wildlife like uh, pileated woodpeckers, or maybe uh, grouse habitat, or uh, pheasants, or something like that. And you may want to eliminate a nuisance, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Well, to get started, you might want to think about what the markets are in Northeast Oregon. We've got basically two markets. One is for chips, for paper products, both for a low quality and high quality paper products, and that kind of depends on whether the, the uh, paper mill has a digester or not. And this, I've listed three companies in Northeast Oregon that have bought chips in the past. There are other companies, Warehouser Company, Longview Fiber, uh, James River, that are not actually located in this area, but that do buy chips and they, they ship them or truck them uh, down to uh, generally the Portland area, West Coast. Generally, these, are, these trees have a, a diameter of about three to four uh, inches at a minimum. 10 to 12 foot minimum lengths, and the prices run from about 20 to 32 dollars per ton delivered. I think the important aspect here is that, from what I understand from talking to folks in the industry, is that those prices are, or at some point in time in the future, are going to rival conifer fiber prices, which have been in the neighborhood of 40 to 50 dollars. Another market is veneer. Generally, this is used for plywood core stock. Uh, Boise Cascade has purchased uh, cottonwood logs for, uh, for this kind of use in the past. It's kind of a sporadic market. Uh, right now, they're not buying uh, for, for veneer. Uh, Alpine Veneer in Portland has also purchased logs and trucked them to Portland for veneer, mostly cottonwood again. These are generally higher quality logs, but they're not the bigger trees. These are trees that are younger age trees. They have small diameter limbs, fewer limbs, uh, and the kind of the wolfy, uh, larger, older trees are not good, uh, do not make good uh, veneer. So generally, though, the, the top <coughs> diameters are somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 20 inches. And uh, you, as you can see, the, the price is up there. It's 40 to $45 a ton. So it's a, it's a better market price-wise. If, if there is a market. Landowners that might be considering selling probably want to answer several questions before they, they actually go through the process of shrink it. OK. There we go. Whoops, that's focus. Is that focus? Can you see it? Okay, is that better? Mm -hmm. I can't really see it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, anyway, so some of the questions they might want to ask before they go through the process of selling their, their wood would be, you know, what are my goals and objectives for doing this sale? What's for sale? Do I have a plan, a silvicultural plan for this forest? How will the timber be sold? What's the bottom line? How much am I going to get? What's my net to me? And what is the hard value worth the other soft values? And I'm going to go through each one of these in a little bit more detail. What are my goals and objectives? There's probably lots of different goals and lots of different objectives. And I've just listed some here as an example. In terms of long-term goals, ownership goals anyway, we could grow timber for profit, either for fiber or for veneer or both. We could try to produce cover for things like pheasants, rough grouse, and white-tailed deer. 
We might have uh, a cottonwood forest or an aspen forest that we use as uh, a recreational site. We may have a stream through it. We might like to bring our family there and uh, have a picnic or whatever. And we may want to hold it as an investment. Our sale objectives on this side could be we want a net top dollar for the sale. We want to get a fair price. We want to minimize the hassle. We want to complete the sale as quickly as possible. We might want to follow our silvicultural plan. We might want to just improve forest health. The point here is that these two need to match up. If we have an, a long-term goal of things, uh, something like personal or family recreation, and, and yet we want to minimize the hassle and hurry up and get this thing over with as quick as possible, you can run into conflicts. Now, you may not be satisfied down the road after the sale is over with, with what actually came out of this because it does take time and effort to, to do a good job. So the point is, uh, to prevent conflict, th these need to be compatible, at least need, need to think about them. OK, what's for sale? Listed here are just a few things that you could think about in terms of getting some kind of an inventory for your particular forest you're thinking about selling. We could look at species. A lot of these stands have conifer species that are scattered through them. And are, you, know, you have to decide, are you going to sell those conifers with, with uh, aspen or with the cottonwoods? Generally, the conifers are going to be worth more. And you need to decide whether they're going to go or not. And also, you don't want to sell them at the same price as, as the cottonwood, for example. What's the quality? Do you have veneer logs or disc chips or both? You don't want to sell veneer logs for chip prices. You want to get an estimate of the total volume. And <coughs> that relates total volume and also per acre volume. That relates to you knowing something about the value of this, this timber you're thinking of selling. Uh, it helps you get a fair price, just like anything else. It's also used as a bargaining tool or a marketing tool you can use with the buyers. The more information you have uh, and the more knowledge you have, the uh, better able you are to, to, uh, to get a fair price. Some knowledge of the defect in the stand is important. If you've got a lot of defect, uh, you don't want that going to the mill. You're paying for the, the logging, the skidding, the trucking, and all that, and yet when they, it gets to the mill, you don't get paid for it. You only get paid for the net merchantable value or volume uh, of that timber. So you might want to, if you knew that, if you had a high defect, you might want to leave that in the woods. It has other advantages anyway. And then average diameter and piece size of the logs relates to logging cost. Small timber is going to cost more to log than larger timber. How's the timber going to be sold? There are different ways to sell timber or logs. You can pay, <coughs> usually there are two basic ways, stumpage and delivered logs. The owner, in a stumpage sale, the owner's paid a price for the trees on the stump. The buyer arranges for the logging and the transportation, and the price then accounts for that logging and transportation. Delivered logs, on the other hand, is where the, the owner or the, the seller sells to the logs delivered to the mill, and, and the owner then has to arrange for the logging and the transportation. There's more risk involved there and there's also more effort and time on the, and knowledge on the part of the seller. But, but usually, they get a, a, a more net profit as a result. The, the point here is that there are different ways to sell timber. There are advantages and disadvantages of, of, of these different ways. And it depends on the landowner's interest, experience, and the amount of time that they have uh, in, in terms of how they want to do that. And that's pretty much landowner driven. OK, what is the stumpage recovery value? This relates to the net to the landowner. That's just the mill delivered price minus the sum of the logging costs, the trucking costs, the taxes, the state and federal tax, and the administration of the sale. That equals the stumpage recovery value, or the net. In this example, we can see that you've got 32. If, if if you're getting $32 a ton delivered for fiber logs, 
subtracting $25 a ton for logging, $4.40 a ton for transportation. In this case, it's a 100 miles round trip. And you can also do it by, by minute or hour. Uh, plus 50 cents per ton for the state tax. I didn't include administration or federal tax. You can come up with $2.10 per ton net to the landowner. If you take a truckload of that, a truckload will haul about 25 tons. Multiply that times the stumpage recovery value, and you get $52.50 a ton. Of course, as the distance increases to the mill, if you maintain the same price, your, your stumpage value is, or your stumpage recovery value is going to go down. What are the hard values, or are the hard values, worth the soft values? We've talked a lot about the benefits of cottonwood and aspen uh, throughout this seminar series. And I th you could weigh the wildlife, the visual, the water, the filtering benefits of retaining cottonwood and aspen uh, with the net dollar you get, whatever that is. The bottom line, then, is, is a stumpage recovery value less than, equal to, or more than the value of these other things. And that is up to the individual landowner to decide. It depends on their perspective of this whole thing, uh, also their values. And it's, there's, I don't think there's any real right answer, as long as you're within the law. <coughs> OK, let's shift gears a little bit and talk about silvics and management. Silvics is. <coughs> is the biology and the ecology of the particular species we're talking about. This relates to the tolerances this species has to things like, like moisture, light, and uh, temperature. Excuse me. So in other words, like I said, it's the ecology and the biology of the tree. And there are probably a lot of different things you could put down here. And I just selected what I thought was probably the most important, which I could, I'm sure there's differences of opinion. But anyway, you see some, some ideas uh, just for food for thought, I guess, thinking about this. But for aspen, some of the key things are that it's intolerant of shade. It needs open conditions to regenerate. It resprouts re readily from fire or logging disturbances. And it's important to note, I think, that from what I've read anyway, that it, this is related to the amount of overstory you have. The more overstory you take off, the more sprouts you get. The other part of that is that in decadent stands, the uh, unhealthy trees yield unhealthy roots. And so if you, the longer you let these stands go and become decadent, the more difficult it's going to be to get your regeneration or your sprouting. And I've, I've heard it over and over. We need to limit browsing to successfully regenerate aspen at least in the Blue Mountains. It res does respond well to thinnings. Uh, at least studies in other parts of the country have shown this. Well, in one study, 40, we got a 42 per they got a 42% increase in diameter growth as opposed to not thinning. It prunes itself very well, naturally. Has a low resistance to stem diseases, which is important in terms of wounding. It's resistant to conifer root diseases, which, which I, I got from Otis. So that may have some implications for managing it in, in conif primarily conifer stands. And in looking at uh, wildlife habitats and managed forests, I counted 151 species of reptiles, birds, and mammals that use aspen, which is about 40% of all the wildlife species in the Blue Mountains. So it does have a significant uh, wildlife uh, benefit. Cottonwood on, has some similarities and some differences. It's intolerant of shade, same as aspen. It regenerates by seed, by broken shoots, and you can also uh, use rooted cuttings and non-rooted cuttings. You need exposed mineral soil for uh, regeneration, successful regeneration, particularly with the seed and the broken shoots. It's sensitive to uh, vegetative competition, and if you want to get uh, cottonwood established, you need to do something with uh, that competing vegetation, at least in the, in the establishment phase. It has rapid initial growth, you know, heights of four to six feet per year, diameters up to six to eight inches in, in eight or ten years. So it grows very rapidly initially. It has a low resistance to stem uh, fungi. 
Uh, that can relate to if you fall it and you're logging it or whatever, you fall it and you do, don't get back in there for a year, it could be, it could have quite a significant amount of rot in it. And also for wounding, it's important. And it responds also well to thinnings. Just as a, an exercise in, in kind of generating some discussion, I put down some, some options, I guess you call them. Uh, first for aspen, uh, one with a timber production objective and one with a more of a wildlife water aesthetics objective. Under timber product, both for timber and for the, uh, the, the wildlife water and aesthetics, in order to regenerate the stands, you're going to have to use some kind of even-aged management silviculture. You're also going to have to manage the browsing. But for timber production, doing things like thinning young stands before they begin to compete to the point where they slow growth, uh, removing uh, the poor quality diseased trees to promote uh, quality uh, trees down, down the road is going to be important, limiting stem damage, and promoting uh, conifers and root rot pockets. Maybe some ideas for, for managing in terms of timber production. In terms of the other, uh, leaving snags and recruitment snags, uh, different sizes diff uh, in terms of diameter and height, creating several age classes between stands. Different uh, wildlife species use uh, different age classes of, of aspen. So if you created different stages of development of aspen on your property, if you had a large enough, pro large enough property, you would increase the diversity of wildlife. And promoting the understory per, uh, allows more diversity at the, at the forest floor level and vertical diversity plus cover plus perhaps food, which would enhance wildlife anyway. Cottonwood, comparing timber and, and a wildlife objective, Timber, we'd, I think you'd probably want to go with an even-aged system on short rotations, particularly if you're interested in fiber production, planting superior cuttings, controlling uh, competing vegetation, again, and then thinning young stands, promoting quality, pruning selected trees. This tree doesn't prune itself naturally as well as aspen does. So pruning for veneer, for example, may be, may be something to think about and limiting damage. With wildlife, you could have a fee hunting operation, for example, and, and some of these stringer cottonwood stands provide good habitat for, provide habitat for things like pheasants and also white-tailed deer. And in my opinion, and it's just an observation, it seems like white-tailed deer are on the increase and there may be a potential for fee hunting white-tailed deer uh, in the Grand Ronde Valley or other, other of these valleys in Northeast Oregon. Again, snags, um, some new, some old. Some older stands, uh, but also some newer stands to create that diversity, edge effect, and so on. Plant more acres equals more habitat. Keep density moderate to high for the cover for both game birds and, and for deer, I think would be important. But that's also, at the higher levels, is gonna shade out your understory, which could, there's a balancing act, I think, there. Okay, I'd like to say a couple words about nuisance management, and it's not my term, I, I, I stole it from somebody else, but this is a very real situation that a lot of landowners have to deal with, and that is some of these stands are older uh, stands of cottonwood, um, I've, got broke, I've got dead tops um, and are declining, they're older stands and declining, and you see them all over uh, throughout this valley and, and also in Wallowa County. And those branches during the winter come out, uh, fall on the farmer's field, they get some cotton to swather, he's trying to hay. Uh, other, for, other farm equipments, uh, has, he's got to deal with that. It, it, these stands shade his crops and lower his yields, and they may damage fences. They fall on the fences, cattle get out or sheep or whatever, and then he's got the cost of repairing them. I don't know what the solution is, but so one idea would be to grow short rotation cottonwood along the fence line or along the, those crop lines and along the fences and then older stands next to the stream. Now some of these stringers aren't that wide but some of them are and you could maybe do that. You could keep the, 
in doing that, you keep the height down uh, along the field with those shorter rotation trees. And then if you, and the other aspect is if, if they're younger trees, they have smaller branches and they don't break off as easily or as often as older trees. And then you could also thin heavier along the field to allow more light through there. Of course, it depends on the orientation of the stream and to the field and so on, but that's one idea. But also, you could weigh the benefits of the trees in terms of its wind buffering effects for reducing soil erosion on those croplands, uh, protecting cattle from cold winds in the wintertime, and then snow management, uh, orienting or, or growing cottonwoods so that uh, you control where the snow goes instead of on the road, it's in the field. And this just gives you an idea, my uh, attempt at artistry, which is pretty pathetic. One thing I noticed, I forgot to put any water in the stream. <laughs> but this, if this is north up here, then the sun is going to be in this, uh, in this pattern. And what you could, you know, this is kind of the, uh, carrying on with the same thought. You'd have the older stand next to the stream. You'd have some snags, uh, some larger trees, provide shading, uh, stream bank stability, the wildlife habitat, and so on. And then in a strip along the field, and this is the field over here, and this is a fence, you'd have uh, uh, short rotation trees growing denser towards the larger timber and spaced out uh, towards, the f towards the field. Um, just an idea. In conclusion, from folks in the industry, it's their opinion that all fiber is going to be growing in value, and that as that value increases, I think there'll be more options available to folks. Um, there'll be more money involved, and so we'll have more, more dollars to invest in things like multiple use uh, uh, practices on, on these uh, cottonwood and aspen stands. <coughs> Plantations may be much more attractive financially, and so we'll see more, uh, just more stands developed or grown. And if landowners are considering, if folks are considering selling, uh, I think it's important to, to weigh all the benefits, both the soft benefits we talked about for the environment and the financial benefits, and think about that in the long term. You know, what's that t stand going to be like in the future? Where do you want it to go? What are the values going to do uh, in terms of the, uh, as far as the, the timber quality? and its production uh, in terms of uh, tons per acre or whatever in the future. But think long term. And if you decide to sell, then if you follow the steps, and we have some publications that, that can help there too, uh, you'll have a successful sale that meets uh, your objectives. Okay, okay thanks, Paul. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there'll be questions later. Okay. Our second speaker then will be Otis Lowry, and Otis is with BLM again, and he's going to talk about uh, management from a public viewpoint. Thanks, Bill. I want to just give you a few ideas tonight to think about, and uh, my perspective is going to be uh, from the BLM point of view. However, I'd like for you to, uh, to uh, look at it for its pertinence and applicability to all land managers. I want to start by reading a paragraph from Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac, and then I'll give you some uh, uh, general functions, important functions of cottonwood and aspen uh, in the environments in which they grow, and then I'll talk about uh, a management strategy we're considering, some things we've already done, their success and cost, which will get us into a little bit of economics, not much, and, uh, and that'll wrap it up. So let's start by uh, going to Madison, Wisconsin on March 4th, 1948. Uh, the essay is The Round River. The outstanding scientific discovery of the 20th century is not television or radio, but rather the complexity of the land organism. Only those who know the most about it can appreciate how little is known about it. The last word in ignorance is the person who says of an animal or plant, what good is it? 
if the land mechanism as a whole is good and every part is good, whether we understand it or not. If the biota in the course of eons have built something we like but do not understand, then who but a fool would discard seemingly useless parts to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. So uh, in our hoped for intelligent tinkering at the BLM, we've decided to keep the cog and wheels of Aspen and Cottonwood. Uh, it's a new thing for us, hardwood silviculture, hardwood management. Let's look at some of the things that are important to us, and I think to everyone, as far as the function of these species in uh, their environments. Looking at uh, the streams, riparian zones, we find probably one of the most important functions of cottonwood and aspen in providing for fish habitat, shade, woody material, and insects for the fish themselves. And something that's really important that uh, really impressed me is water storage. When you look at, if you look at a, at a riparian segment, a stream segment that's a quarter mile wide and a half mile long and 25 feet deep, you can store about 35% of that biome can be water, can be stored water. If the stream is on the surface and the area is vegetated with cottonwoods and aspen, other hardwood trees and shrubs, you can store up to 687 acre feet in that area. If the area is eroded down six or eight feet, there's no cottonwood aspen, there's no other hardwood trees, no shrubs, you're looking at 135 acre feet in that same area. Uh, it's amazing. You can steer, store huge amounts of water uh, in a healthy repairing zone, a place where cottonwood and aspen are, are, are growing. An engineer friend of mine with SCS was quite taken by that. Below ground storage and no dams and no maintenance and, and whatever. So uh, uh, when you look at that, you have to realize that, that uh, there's been a lot of research done in that area. And in the prairie states, they found that as cottonwood declined, and left the riparian zones, that prairie grass came in and took over the site, and they had massive erosion. And they could tie that directly to the retreated cottonwood. Looking at uh, cottonwood, not only in the riparian zone, in the stream zone, but also on the uplands, it's really a, a key wildlife habitat for birds and animals, and that's really important to us in our wildlife management programs. Uh, look at aspen, for instance. Uh, Rough grouse populations can be tied directly to aspen populations, almost one for one. Sharp-tailed grouse, we'd like to reintroduce those birds. We're making an attempt in Wallowa County. Uh, riparian zones with cottonwood and aspen are very important to those birds. Deer, white-tailed deer, mule deer, uh, elk. Riparian zones with cottonwood and aspen or upland stands provide important habitat for those species. And something that we're really starting to look at for probably the last 10, 12, 15 years are the roles that these birds and animals play in the health of the upland forest as well as the riparian forest, as well as the farmland or the grasslands. And a species that comes to my mind is the flying squirrel, living in a cottonwood cavity and transporting mycorrhizal fungi into the conifer stand. And that's really important. We're all becoming aware of that. Or if you look at a a barn owl family living in that same cottonwood tree in another cavity, uh, they might consume anywhere from 12 to 1400 ground squirrels from a nearby field or pasture. So there's a lot of, of uh, interrelationships between the birds and animals that utilize cottonwood and aspen as habitat. It's really important habitat. Uh, an interesting fact about palatability and, and nutrition from cottonwood is I read that uh, you can feed livestock up to 48% of their diet with aspen pellets and they don't lose weight. You can maintain them and that was really interesting to me. But if you look at some other functions of cottonwood and aspen, they're a real buffer in our forest. Uh, they buffer uh, insect and disease impacts and also uh, they're real important fire breaks. They buffer the spread of wildfire. Aspen is identified as one of the very best green fire break species. Uh, probably historically, we had uh, a lot of cottonwoods and aspen in our major stream zones and in our side draws, even in our intermittent stream areas and within our stands. And uh, this broke up the continuous host type for insects. We were all familiar with the situation in the Blue Mountains with uh, the defoliators and a continuous host type. Well, uh, cottonwood and aspen are an opportunity to break those continuous host types up. 
as far as uh, disease organisms, root rots, uh, cottonwood and aspen are a good species to go in those pockets of root rot to provide structure and, and all the benefits of a hardwood forest. Uh, getting back to fire, we have a lot of continuous fuel loading. We talk about continuous host types for insects, and with the next breath we talk about continuous fuel loadings due to the absence of fire in our ecosystems. And stringers of hardwoods, in particular cottonwood and aspen, provide valuable fuel breaks to break up these continuous fuel loadings so that we'll have a chance to catch a fire before it consumes large acreages. So there's a lot of benefits uh, to cottonwood and aspen. The functions they serve and the environments in which they grow provide, provide a lot of different things. In the area of water storage, and a really interesting fact is beaver can really dramatically increase that water storage when they're put back into the system. But you gotta remember that beaver eat about four pounds of bark a day takes about 200 aspen to keep one beaver going. So before you come in to, to keep your water system going and put beaver, you might lose your whole investment. Let's look at uh, a management scheme that BLM is, is proposing. We're looking at an inventory process, which everyone should do, to find out where your populations of cottonwood and aspen are. And then you need to map those. And then it's really handy to have them in some kind of a database, probably a computer database. And then you, uh, there's a good possibility of going to these, to these populations and, and uh, creating what we call mother stands or mother plantations. And what we do is, is by uh, uh, mulching or fertilizing or pruning or burning or harvesting these stands, we'd encourage sprouting. And we'd also need to protect them from browsing, uh, like Paul <coughs> talked about. And what you do is you go into these stands after you've done this and you collect plant material, seed and cuttings and you propagate them in a nursery. Or you take them directly to the site and, uh, and take cut limbs and stick it right into the, in the water of the creek. And what you do is you bring that material back to the same area that you got it from and you begin to repopulate your environment uh, with cottonwood and aspen in the places that they historically grew. Uh, some interesting things to look at is you need to go to specialists and talk to them about this procedure because I'm just hitting the top of this, and there's a lot of things that you need to know. One thing about Aspen is you need to keep it within two degrees north and south, or about 120 miles of the location that your material came from. So if you collect material, seed, or cuttings, it needs to go somewhere within that two degrees north and south. Uh, these are some things that people can tell you about at BLM or State Forestry or, or Boise Cascade, people that are working with these species. In the case of uh, cottonwoods, Cottonwoods have both a male and female tree, and the males tend to cling to the drier sites and the females to the wetter sites. You find the females more in the upper parts of your draws, the males in the lower parts. And so you need to uh, collect material, propagate it, go back the next year, see what uh, sex the tree was, try to get the other sex from the same area, and move it also. Uh, you need to be careful to put males back on dry sites and females back on more sites, and that's what we're looking at doing. As we build these new mother plantations, you know, spreading cottonwood and aspen out into the other parts of, of their uh, environment, uh, we have to get a little bit into economics. And so let's look at some things we've done in the past. We have about 50 exclosures on the Baker Resource Area of the BLM, and we've done a lot of work with hardwoods in those exclosures, and uh, with, with really good success. We have uh, quite a bit of cottonwood mostly from uh, cuttings. We have some aspen from seed. We did some work in the Dooley Mountain wildfire. We fenced about 1,500 acres and revegetated four and a half miles of stream. We put in about 20,000 plants, 3,000 cottonwood, and 3,000 aspen and 1,000 cottonwood. Uh, looking at cost, these plants, the aspen were from seed, collected in that area, and grown uh, at a local nursery and then taken back to the site. And the plants, uh, the aspen and cottonwood that were from about three feet high cost us 60 cents a piece. We used uh, inmate labor to put them in the ground and that cost us about three cents each. Had you uh, done that with a contract on the open market, it would have cost about 10 times that much. We did do 125 cottonwood. We grew them two seasons to eight feet tall for structure and put them in there. They cost $12 a piece. So, uh, it's not cheap. And 
What we're looking at in the economics of cottonwood and aspen management is we have to have a lot of input in the beginning. Our stands are really few and in bad shape, so it's going to take a lot of input to get them back. We'll have some immediate output or gains in wildlife habitat, water storage, those kinds of things. We're going to our streams and, and we're bringing the water table up, filling the streams with large weed debris and bringing the water table up, reforesting with cottonwood and aspen and other species and seeing immediate gains in wildlife habitat. And so you do have some immediate gains. We hope in the future to look for forest products gains, to be able to go in these stands and to uh, recycle these stands by harvest and encourage the suckering and production of seed and healthy plants. Uh, I think that uh, it's an area well worth pursuing, and we plan to pursue it. And uh, welcome any questions. Stop by the office, see what we're doing. We're pioneers and beginners and learning as we go. Uh, so we'd encourage you to uh, ask us some questions. Thank you. Thanks, Otis. Okay, our next speaker is Rick, Rick Wagner from the Oregon Department of Forestry. I'm going to get to ask the uh, first question when it comes question and answer. I want to find out where Otis looks to find out what sex these trees are. They're male or female here. So I'm going to uh, probably pick up a little bit where uh, Paul and Otis left off on, uh, on, uh, on the discussion there. Um, I want to give you a little bit of background about how the uh, Department of Forestry got involved in some of this. During the early part of the 1990s, uh, we began receiving notification of operations for cottonwood harvesting. Because in the state of Oregon, anytime you harvest a, a commercial species, uh, you have to go through the uh, Department of Forestry notification process. And that triggers uh, uh, a couple different uh, items. One is that we check to make sure that um, uh, we're not winding up with damage to a resource out there. There's some rules that have to be followed. And then in certain cases, oftentimes, there's uh, some harvest and severance tax that has to be paid. And, and, and although there was hard cash to the landowners, as Paul identified for the cottonwoods in Aspen, we're going to see those values very minimal. If you get to thinking about how much wood is on a log truck, uh, and you look at $52.50 at this stage of the game, uh, that's, that's not a lot of money. And we saw a lot of folks taking advantage of this situation though to harvest um, uh, trees in certain areas and, and they took advantage of this due to the perception that uh, as Otis said especially reading from the Sand County Almanac there that a lot of people's belief that uh, there were very minimal benefits um, across the diversity of values and objectives primarily on the private lands and I'm going to get into some of this stuff but I want to primarily focus on the ranches and the farming here in Eastern Oregon. Uh, for some of you folks, you may even be in that realm, uh, and so uh, day in and day out, you're, you're trying to uh, um, derive an income from that property out there. <coughs> so in essence, uh, we, we saw a lot of operations taking place, and I think one of the main reasons we saw them is because uh, uh, for many folks, they saw, as Paul identified, um, these um, trees basically as nuisances. And, and we'll visit about that a little bit. Anyway, in the spring of 1994, several uh, foresters, specifically forest praxis foresters uh, and biologists from Department of Forestry and Department of Fish and Wildlife came together and we were looking at a variety of issues, but one of the issues we were specifically discussing was this, uh, uh, the cottonwood issue, the harvesting and those different things. Um, it turned out many of the folks that took part in that discussion were not only foresters and biologists, but they were also landowners uh, in different areas, uh, uh, like myself. Uh, uh, my wife and I own a small ranch out there at Ladd Canyon, and on that ranch we've got about uh, three acres of cottonwoods in, in, intermixed with some other stuff we have there. So, so we had both, for some of us, we had both professional, uh, biological interests, but we also had private interests that, that took place there. And, and one of the primary fundamental issues that we focused on was the fact that historically there were, there were a lot of these values, as Paul talked about, these soft values that were not easily quantified. They were not easily identifiable, uh, especially relative to other facets of farming and ranching. And, and oftentimes those values were looked at as, uh, 
as being nuisances rather than some kind of value. As Paul, you know, showed up there, you know, had this cost of, at the case when, when he ran those figures, $52.52 or 50 cents a, a log truck load of, uh, for cottonwoods versus these soft values. And, and how do you weigh these? How do you do that? Um, and so, you know, ultimately the issue was based on how little money actually these trees were really worth uh, versus a question of are they worth far more to a farmer and rancher if left and propagated and effectively integrated, and I think that's a key word, into the overall farming and ranching operation. How could we integrate these species into the farming and ranching operation and actually do better farming and ranching? And, and, uh, and I think there's some things there that uh, we'll identify here in a minute. Thus, there were several of us that embarked on uh, this project to basically quantify some of these intangible values. You know, if somebody says, I'm going to give you so much money for X number of wood, that's pretty tangible. But how do you, how do you uh, come up with a dollar figure of how much snow gets trapped in a cottonwood stand? You know, how, how do you quantify that sort of stuff? And so uh, we wanted to take a look at that and basically come up with an informational and educational tool uh, to help landowners better evaluate the true value um, of, of the commodity of those trees, um, you know, especially before they virtually gave them away, uh, believing that uh, they were essentially valueless. Uh, and so what happened was a lot of these folks in their mind, they say, well, you know, we're, we're convinced they're causing us all this problem, and one of these days I've just got to go out and I gotta, I'm going to have to get out and take care of all those. I'm going to have to get them all cut down. And all of a sudden somebody shows up at their doorstep and says, hey, we'll give you a couple of pennies for those trees. And you know, we're sitting there going, okay, now let me get this straight. I don't have to go take care of them, and you're going to clean it up, and you're, and you're going to pay me a little money on top of this. And so people were kind of getting excited about that. And uh, so tonight, uh, as we jump into the heart of this, and, and I think what I'll do for the screen, I'll, I'll put the uh, basic script over here where we can flip it up for folks taking notes, but I'm going to put my script over here because i got all the little squibbles on here. I want to see all, everybody see all the little notes I'm making, but I'd like to share tonight some of those benefits. I'm going to go into considerably more depth, than what, and, but some of them are going to be the same that Paul and Oda shared, um, but specifically more to farming and ranching, to, to an operation that maybe you, um, uh, some of you folks that are here tonight uh, may be engaging in it, and how specifically you might evaluate those against what you're doing personally. Um, and then... Uh, and, and part of that purpose is to stimulate and motivate thinking about those trees on your private farms and ranches and again evaluate their true value uh, as you can consider managing them for a variety of purposes. Again, uh, just a little tiny bit of background. Uh, um, uh, not only am I a forester, but uh, just to the east of the mouth of uh, Ladd Canyon. Um, Elaine and I are three kids there, have a small ranch where we raise alfalfa. Uh, horses, cows, kids, raise a little bit of fuss and a little bit of cane from time to time. So, uh, but we have a good time. But what's interesting out there, and the reason I bring that up is because it turns out to be a fairly harsh climate out there. Uh, there's nothing like a good old Lad Canyon wind and uh, 20 below zero and wind coming in horizontal. Sometimes uh, you let the kids out the front door and you want to make sure you got a rope on them or you got to go pick them up in the marsh against a fence someplace after a big blow down there. So. Uh, that might be too small. Okay, well, we'll hold off on it. Anyway, uh, to jump into that, uh, and I'm going to reemphasize a couple of these. Many landowners have traditionally not favored the growth or establishment of these, uh, of the cottonwoods or aspen, and, and specifically here for a little bit I'll be talking cottonwoods, because of <coughs> the reality that they, they are brittle. Uh, they wind up in irrigation ditches. Um, on fences, uh, as Paul said, can get out there in your pasture where um, you're trying to mow hay. And there's also been a perception, and, and it's actually been a perception that has been promoted by uh, uh, historic government documents that these plants transpire an incredible amount of water. And there's a truth to that. Uh, but the belief was that if I could get rid of all these trees, I would have more water available for my irrigation needs. And, uh, and there's a little bit of a relationship there, but it's interesting as you talk to uh, some of the scientists that uh, it's not as easy as just that. There's some other things going on there. So uh, that's, we, we heard that a lot. We gotta get rid of these cottonwoods because they're taking all the water out of the creek and I haven't got any water for irrigation. Um, but anyway, uh, so those were some of the negative things, but as we talked about, there were some other, 
There's a lot of other beneficial things that we believe that are a significant benefit to the landowner and the landscape in many ways that basically haven't been well understood and ultimately fully evaluated um, and, and, can, and, and really can equate to increased profits to the, uh, to the farmer and the rancher. We're, we're talking specifically cottonwoods and aspen in this series, but bear in mind <coughs> there's other species that also uh, can fulfill many of these functions, some of the willows, uh, some of the other things there. So it's not specifically limited to that. So, so in basically what has been traditionally viewed as a nuisance, as a pain, as a hindrance to the farming and ranching operation <coughs> may in disguise, and, and, I, and I emphasize that, may in disguise be a benefit if it's properly managed and integrated into that operation. So I'm going to go through and list some of these things. Some of these are going to be a little bit about what Paul talked about. But again, the groves of cottonwoods and other hardwood trees we talked about buffer winds that dry out and carry away valuable topsoil critical for production. A lot of times we say that, but we don't know what it really means until you live in a wind tunnel. Uh, one of our alfalfa fields is just off to the side of one of these cottonwood groves, and there's a significant change in wind velocity as you step about 50 feet from inside the grove to the outside the grove. Uh, our soil out there is very porous. <coughs> We can wind up pouring a lot of water out there. We irrigate every year. Uh, but those stands of alfalfa that we have that are behind uh, some of those uh, cottonwood stands, I don't have to water near as often because I'm not getting that ground's not drying out. Uh, Paul talked about on the crops. He talked about uh, some crops are very, uh, need a lot of light. But it turns out in that particular climate out there, uh, I'm actually looking for some shade. And you say, well, why would you need shade on alfalfa? Well, part of it is, is that, uh, <coughs> again, that ground dries out so fast. And uh, we've got the warm temperatures out there, but we're having a hard time keeping the water to the alfalfa. And you can actually see, wherever I have any of those trees, you can actually look alongside of the field, and you can see uh, the height of the trees almost by the stand of alfalfa that, that's out from it there, because it's a, it's a little higher. I've even got a rock pile out in the middle there, and as the sun goes over, and, and that rock pile starts to cast a shade, I have a better stand of alfalfa on the shade side of that. So not only are we planting out there east-west rows of trees for wind, but we're also basically going to start looking at planting north-south to pick up some shading uh, you know, from those trees uh, because we're finding some advantages to that. And um, I think it's probably as much anything a function of desiccating and drying out that soil as opposed to keeping water in there. Again, the trees, the other thing they do is uh, uh, they're going to provide privacy to your ranch, uh, to your farm, uh, for sounds, roads, railways, undesirable noises. If your ranch house is real close to the road uh, and, and you get to dust the inside of the house at all, you know what that's like. Uh, those trees will catch a lot of dust, and uh, so they'll help out there. Uh, again, in, the, in, in those harsh climates, when the wind's blowing out there, though, those stands can, can produce a significant impact uh, to your feeding regime and to the stress regime that's on your animals. And uh, if you don't believe that, um, you know, next time take your jacket off, uh, take your t-shirt off and go stand out in the middle of the wind and then go stand back inside of those groves and then put yourself in the position of a cow. I know, I, I, you know, I haven't measured this, but I'm absolutely certain we are feeding less feed uh, per animal uh, than some of the folks next door to us that don't have any shelter for those animals. I know we're feeding less feed and those animals are in better condition. They go through the winter in better condition because they've got, um, they've got uh, that buffer again behind. Uh, again, you've heard this before, trees that are strategically located near homes, ranch buildings, farming operations are gonna also help your heating and cooling costs during the summer and during the winter. It's gonna be a significant difference there. Um, one of the things Paul talked about, these trees, they are brittle, they break down a lot. Uh, and on a, a one standpoint, you look at that and you say, that's a real negative thing. But oftentimes, if we take a minute and we stop and we look at that a little bit, sometimes we can turn those negatives into positives. We used to burn all that stuff that fell out of the trees and got in the way down there. Now in the spring, we take a couple days and we go through there and we've established some east-west brush piles that are basically windrows. And we've kind of tied them in there. And the reason we do that is because that also catches snow inside of those uh, cottonwood stands. Uh, but it, but I also find the animal standing on the lee side of those, and there's also brush that comes up through there, and so there's a couple benefits. Well, the third benefit, they also provide a lot of habitat for the quail and anything else that's going on in there. Uh, we've also taken some of those brush piles 
and stack those <coughs> along the stream uh, where we don't have fences for the livestock. Uh, that actually keeps the livestock out of there because they can't get in there and step around all that slash. And so we've got new plants growing up in there and, and that, that'll take care of a, another problem I'll identify here in a minute. Uh, the shade, those trees. Uh, if you've got ponds, stock ponds, you've got some other watering uh, areas in there, they're going to help the evaporation. On those hot days, there's an incredible amount of evaporation that takes place, and that shade uh, uh, is, is very important there. The, uh, a lot of those cottonwood stands, uh, aspen, other hardwood stands, as, as many have already talked about, are, are critical to fish habitat. But one of the things we might not think of as landowners is the value that they um, are to the actual property and resale. And uh, it turns out that in, in some of the studies that, that actually side-by-side side side farms and ranches, all things given equal, those with a uh, fairly good stand of trees on there are worth about 30% more. And uh, because of there, there's a visualness there, there's an aestheticness there, and for those folks that can buy in on what those trees are doing, um, they, uh, they, they've bought in on that. And an interesting point, talking to Errol Clare, who was one of the fish biologists out of uh, John Day there, he told me in recent years he would get uh, several phone calls from real estate agents and they had very wealthy clients that were looking for ranches that had a good fishery stream. They had clients that wanted to buy those ranches for fisheries. Well, you know, if you're selling your ranch at some point in time, you may like to see it kept in production. Maybe those folks will keep it in production, but why not have a very healthy stream in addition to a very productive farm? There's no reason you can't have that. Uh, there are some farms and ranches in parts of Oregon and Klamath Falls specifically that uh, are making a huge percentage of their yearly income just from fee fishing alone, fly-in fishing to Blue Ribbon trout streams. Uh, these trees will help, uh, will help you in, uh, in some of that uh, developing habitat for that. As Otis talked about, the roots of cottonwoods and other hardwoods help to create a soil structure in the stream side that can absorb excess water runoff much like a sponge. The water is stored and released slowly, becoming available later in the summer when water needs are critical. Uh, in many cases, the Eastern Oregon streams have, uh, have improved. And to give you a simple example of that, I, I usually use this when we talk with landowners. I said, you know, go over there to your house and rip off two pieces of gutter. Let's lay them on the back of the tailgate of the truck and let's put sponges in one of those and let's put nothing in the other and take a gallon of water and dump it down both of those. And yeah, you're going to get a lot of water down one, but you get it all at a time of year, you don't need it. Nobody needs all that water to irrigate in, in April and May. What they need water on is later on. But those, those sponges, the root structure, the soil, the things that take place in there wind up absorbing that and wind up releasing that slower over time. So there's a very va uh, big value there. I still yet to find somebody, uh, and I've talked to quite a few people who live, eat, and drink cottonwoods and aspen to give me some actual numbers uh, when we talk about transpiration versus evaporation. And transpiration is what those trees take up and, and, and utilize and give off into the air versus the function of evaporation. You know, there's the, the shade over the tree. Again, and part of that's related to the fact that a lot of people say, well, you gotta get rid of these trees because they're sucking all the water out of the creek. It's not that simple, folks. There, there's a lot more complicated. And don't run out there and knife all the trees down simply because you think you're gonna get more water. Uh, from what I can tell, even with some of the local professionals that deal with this stuff, they know there's a variety of functions taking place, but uh, uh, as, as, as Otis said, uh, we're beginning to see that uh, we're storing much more water uh, with those than without them, so I think that's very important. For those of you folks that own farms and ranches on streams, especially if you've got valuable topsoil, uh, every spring you probably fight loss of that property. and. Uh, and that's pretty important. And those trees can help buffer uh, the erosive effects of those streams, especially if you're in an area with a lot of ice. Uh, that ice rips and tears away at those stream banks, uh, and pretty soon you start losing real estate. And at the price of real estate anymore, we can't afford to lose too much more of that real estate. One of the neat things about cottonwoods and aspen specifically is that they will regenerate fairly fast. This year we finally got part of our stream um, uh, fenced out for a little bit. And I've got an area that's been chipping away every year at, at part of the bank there. And uh, it looks like within two years, just naturally, we'll probably have a pretty good stand of cottonwoods to help buffer that corner there. And so that's, a, that's another benefit. Uh, the groves help trap and retain significant amounts of, of nutrients and topsoil if, if you've got a runoff situation taking place. So they're actually holding that in a buffer strip. 
Uh, cottonwoods and other hardwoods uh, not only provide snow breaks uh, to critical portions of your farming and ranching operation, uh, but there's a lot of water that comes out of those snow drifts. And as I saw in my alfalfa field, I've got about a quarter mile field, I watched all it, it would snow and we'd get about a foot of snow on the flat and then overnight it would be gone and I'd go over and look at my neighbor when it's all stacked in his backyard. Well, you know, being kind of the selfish individual I was, I thought, well, I don't think he needs all that water for his flowers. I'd just soon put that back on my field back there. So that's one of the reasons we have planted some of the east to west uh, windbreaks there is to try to catch some of that snow. He's going to be happy because he can get into his house now. But, uh, but we'll also be able to trap a significant amount of water and keep that on the property there. Uh, if you have a pond in a wind zone, orient your trees behind that pond so that it catches snow drifts and you'll have that snow, uh, that snow drift to help fill your pond in the spring. So there's some things there. Uh, again, it uh, doesn't, doesn't take much of a tree or anything to start stacking some of that up. Um, the cottonwood and other hardwoods, again, as they've talked about, provide critical habitat for a number of game uh, and aquatic species, can often improve hunting. But there's some other values that the public is uh, becoming more and more engaged in. You might not think of this, but there are people out there that will pay a fairly sizable uh, fee just to come in f for, fo for photography or other recreational opportunities. Uh, you know, and sometimes I look at that and I go, boy, that's a, that's a pretty minimal use on the land. If a person could derive some income and integrate that in with their operation so they might not have to work the land quite so hard, um, um, you know, that might be something to consider. Uh, I know down south here in the, in the Ironside country, uh, there's some folks down there that are deriving a fair amount of income just from that. And, uh, um, you know, and of course, those photography opportunities are based on the fact that there's some wildlife, some other species taking place there to take pictures of. So um, it, it just appears to me on our small operation that farmers and ranchers need to basically take advantage of every opportunity that they can uh, to, uh, you know, to integrate different opportunities of money-making things in there. And, and as our urban areas get larger and larger, uh, more and more people are seeking, if you will, rural experiences. And whether that's on a farm or out in the woods, and uh, uh, some people are willing to pay a significant amount of money for some of those experiences. One of the things that we saw, <coughs> excuse me, on our, uh, on our farm out there, uh, very dramatically was the value of these trees um, relative to predators. As farmers and ranchers, you, you deal with a lot of different things uh, uh, on your crops, on your fields out there, and sometimes it's hard to quantify just how many bugs a bird eats or uh, how many squirrels uh, an owl eats. But I know when we bought that place out there, we had quite a problem with the ground squirrel chewing up the alfalfa fields, and uh, you don't notice that until you start riding your horse out there, you start trying to mow hay, and every time you're mowing, you're mowing rocks and dirt mounds and everything else. And, so I said, well, I don't know, how are we going to get rid of these squirrels? And so you start thinking of the traditional methods of, uh, you know, of uh, different control measures, traps and poisons and things like that. And I was talking to Mark Hengem one day from the Fish and Wildlife, and this had to do with up in the woods, and we were uh, talking about the value of snags. And I said, well, can you quantify some values to these snags to landowners? I mean, it's nice to see birds, and they're pretty, but what do those birds mean in dollars and cents to a landowner? He says, well, at this stage of the game, we haven't done much up in the woods, but we did do this study, and Otis uh, alluded to that, that they looked at a family of barn owls in, uh, in the valley, and over the course of that one year, that, that one single family of owls and their offspring uh, consumed between 1,200 and 1,400 squirrels, mice, rodents. That, 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 that's one family of owls. Well, I quit worrying about snags in the woods, and I started asking them. I said, okay, now, how do I get a hold of, and where can I buy a handful of these little owls? <laughs> and, uh, and so Mark got me turned on to some owl nests, and surprisingly enough, we, we have a couple families of owls now. But one of the things we did do out there is, as in most farms and ranches, there's, there's what I call dead ground, ground that's actually not prime farm. You know, you know, we're not running the plows and the discs and the cedars and everything through. Sometimes that's near fences, sometimes that's near creek, sometimes that's near rocky seams out in the field there. And one day I got to thinking about that and I thought, you know, if, if those owls do so well, maybe I ought to help them out because our fields are fairly flat out there. I thought, maybe we ought to stick a perch out there and maybe I ought to do it, maybe I ought to put it right where the squirrels are. And so, you know, when the owl sits on there, he's got his lunch bucket right between his legs there. All he's got to do is jump off there. 
And, and so we did that, um, Christopher, my son, and I, uh, we took some 55-gallon drums and uh, uh, cut the tops out of them, rolled them out there, full, filled them full of rocks, and stuck some 20-foot poles in there with a cross arm and sat back and watched. And, and we set those up on the edge of the fields where those squirrel colonies are. And I should have counted those, but I know we had probably over 50 to, 50 to 60 uh, different squirrel families out there two years ago. And as a result of some of the stuff we do, uh, we had a hard time finding some to hunt this last spring. I figure we were down to probably 10 or 12. And, uh, and we actually saw some of those predators hunting off those perches. Uh, and so that was something simple to do. I got Mother Nature working for me. It's not costing me anything. And, uh, and we're making some, uh, you know, we're doing fairly well there. So there, there's some, and, and that's stuff we can see and we can quantify. There's some other, there's some other uh, uh, predatory uh, relationships out there that we don't see that are very important. Um, basically, uh, and, and, and that's kind of the bulk of these things in a, in, a, in a nutshell, but in summary, as farmers and ranchers, there's natural processes that take place out there from, uh, you know, from uh, the streams to the wind to a lot of different things that take place. And those natural processes are very powerful, uh, and they continually affect what it is we do out there. And oftentimes, as farmers and ranchers, we find ourselves fighting those forces and they become a battle day in and day out and, and, and sometimes they tend to wear us down. And, and one of the things that uh, you know, we tend to take a look at and we talk about some of these forces specifically with the cottonwoods, the issue is maybe if historically the reason why you're trying to get rid of those is because you believe they're a negative thing to your operation, it might be an opportunity to take a look at those rather from the negative side to the positive side and rather than fighting them try to figure out how you could integrate those into your operation to do better financially, aesthetically, uh, biologically, and overall have a better operation taking, their, taking place there for you. And so we believe that when closely evaluated, many opportunities exist to cooperate with these natural processes, specifically with these trees, to manage operations in a more practical and profitable manner, rather than try to fight those things. So the value and benefits of cottonwoods and other trees and associated brush species we don't believe have been very well historically um, well understood or documented relative specifically to farming and ranching. And, and so we, we throw a lot of these things out. We're in the process of developing a cottonwood brochure. Uh, we do have some handouts here for this group. And if some of the other stations would like some of the information, we have some stuff on windbreaks, uh, conservation trees, riparian buffers. Uh, and if you'd like to write to Bill, we can get some stuff to you there. But, but as you decide to do different things with the commodities on your property, we wanted to provide this as a tool with which to evaluate. Don't just jump out there and decide I'm going to strip everything off there because of some perceptions that everything's totally negative. Before you do that, at least give that an opportunity. Think about some of the positive things that may be taking place out there. Um, after I personally completed working with these folks completing this project, I started taking a long, hard look at the stand we had behind our place and begin to look at it a little closer and the values that that actually provided us. And um, the values of those cottonwoods are going to have to significantly increase beyond $52.52 a log truckload uh, before I harvest any of those trees. Uh, I may manage those a little differently. I may cut some of those down, but we will probably use the residue to uh, bolster up some other portion of the operation, whether that's a uh, whether that's a windbreak or along the stream or buffering a corner of the stream with a big piece of wood, uh, um, you know, to use that there. So one of the very last things uh, for you folks that uh, may be motivated into doing some stuff, through the Watershed Health Program this last year and in cooperation with uh, the Private Land Forestry Network, uh, Department of Forestry, and several other groups and agencies, uh, uh, we're in the process of constructing a fairly large cooler tree facility here in uh, um, La Grande. Um, that facility won't, will not just store trees, but we're also going to be having a significant amount of tools, educational opportunities, videos, and, and so basically if you decide you want to plant something on the property for whatever it is you want to plant it, whether it's up in the piney woods or down in the riparian areas, um, hopefully that'll be a one-stop shop. If you're into riparian stuff or wildlife sort of plantings, uh, we'll obviously refer you to the fish and wildlife folks. Uh, but a lot of that material we hope to maybe come through there. And uh, we're probably not going to let it get out of there until you have a good understanding of how to get it planted. 
and, and, and achieve the best result for survivability because past years, uh, um, history has shown that we're, re we're getting a lot of mortality because trees aren't, and, and hardwood trees and conifers aren't being handled right after they leave the cooler. And uh, with the tools and things we have there, we hope to increase that. It's going to be a significant facility. Uh, the first cooler we're putting in has the capacity of a million seedlings. Uh, we'll put another one close to it shortly thereafter that'll probably be half a million. So in the coming years, there'll be a facility there to uh, basically help folks uh, propagate uh, the different trees they want to handle there. So, ran a little bit over time, but uh, uh, we will, uh, that'll finish my talk. And Bill, I'll turn it back over and okay. to you here, and we can. Well, why don't we questions. just go ahead and have the other uh, speakers go up front there? And Rick, you just stay put, and we'll have questions for you. <clears throat> Hopefully, the audio bridges are hooked up and uh, ready to roll. Do we need to push any buttons up here if anybody asks a question or? No, you're just live. You're okay. Questions from the audience? Here in Legrand, we, we can start here in Legrand. Go ahead. You just push your button down once and then when you're done, push it back up. I have a question concerning site preparation for cottonwood cuttings. Uh, we're trying to plant them out in our meadow and there's a lot of grass growing there and we've just driven them into the ground but the grass is probably not doing them any good. What should I do about that? Several, op <coughs> several options. <coughs> Your objective of course is to, to get rid of or, or reduce the, the competition. And you can do that. And the other, other thing, if it's an old field, you might want to think about whether that field is compacted from, uh, from either we thought about clipping those on your nose, but they don't stay on real well, do they? No. Uh, whether it's been compact, whether the soil's been compacted from maybe livestock uh, years of livestock use or something like that, that'll help loosen the soil and, and you get good root develop development. One thing you can do when they're already in the ground, and you want to, and you want to you know, improve the survival and growth of those trees. About the only thing you could do that I can think of is uh, is a herbicide application, and that may you know we can talk about what options you'd have there. Um, there are several that you probably could use, but if you don't have them in the ground first, I would recommend some kind of summer fallowing almost, or working the ground. You know, maybe a, an herbicide application of something like uh, Roundup or Accord uh, to, to kill the grass and then some kind of uh, plowing or disking, uh, working the ground through the summer so it's pretty much weed free when you go in the following spring to put your cuttings in. One thing to remember in uh, cottonwood is they like to have their feet in the water and uh, so the first couple of years they get down to the water, if you don't put them right in the water to start with, we put cottonwood right in the water and have good success is you need to water those trees. And they are real susceptible to competition, grass especially. And so you can hand clear around each seedling, you know, hand scalp a spot and put your cutting in. But the real important thing is, is water availability. They really need to have water for success. I might uh, add to that a little bit. Uh, uh, again, in the, the, the harsh desert of Lad Canyon out there. One of the things we did this year upon recommendation with NRCS and and uh, I saw some, I, I scoffed at it when, when we first did it and now that it's done uh, uh, ha have seen some values there that I'm not even sure that they had quantified. But we used, and especially in a, uh, in a field operation, this works very well, uh, uh, the first thing you do is, is till probably about a 10 foot wide if you're planting them in rows and, and get that tilled up, worked up pretty good, get that sod layer rolled over and if you have an opportunity to, to even do that several months ahead of time and then disc that again to, to, to kill that grass. But we used a mulch mat and we used, a, it's a six foot wide, you can get it different widths and um, um, there's a machine that goes right behind the tractor, it's a three point machine that that roll goes on and basically you you anchor it down on one end there 
Uh, and then there's a person that sits back there, and you can either plant the trees after you lay this down, it means you got to cut a little slit in it and plant it, or you can plant your trees first, lay it over, and then as you as the tractor rolls forward and this stuff rolls out, the person with the uh, with a little can of spray paint, as the tree goes underneath the roll, he he marks it with the can of spray paint, and then the kids or whoever behind you comes behind you and cuts a little X and pulls it up through there. Well, that does several things. That particular mulch mat. Uh, uh, is dark. Uh, so number one, it warms the soil, so your soil is a little warmer. Number two, uh, after the ultraviolet breaks down the fibers in there, it will absorb water, but it does not allow it to evaporate very fast, and so it holds moisture in there. And thirdly, what we found was that when we plant those trees, if we can create a little bit of a divot where those trees are, and then set a rock pretty close to that tree when it rains, it, it acts like a, almost a, a guzzler situation, and the water comes down and runs off that and focuses right into where the tree is. And so rather than the water percolating all the way around the tree, it's focused right around those roots. Um, and, then and then the final thing we did uh, uh, is we bought a, uh, uh, the, the guts for a drip irrigation system and hooked that up. Uh, that doesn't take, it sounds like a big deal, but it doesn't take a lot of money and effort to, uh, to, to hook that up in that first year. Now again, that's not, that may not going to help you out in uh, the piney woods are along a creek, but if you've got a ranching farming operation, you're trying to do something with that where you can get machinery in there. Um, I decided that was well worth the money. It cost a little money, but my survivability was extremely high. On my Carragana, I had 100% survivability. On my other hardwoods, I was probably in the 96, 97%. My conifers, I was a little bit lower. I was probably 80%. Uh, but we had a lot of success with that. One thing to remember in planting hardwoods is is our first attempts on repairing planting, we had long straight rows of cottonwood and straight rows of red oak dogwood. And we were putting the cottonwood and the water and the red oak dogwood slightly away from it and the willow up on the bank. But uh, we realized that's not how uh, these species occur in the natural world. And so if you observe as you drive around how things grow together, what they grow with and how they grow, we started family planting cottonwoods, aspen, red oak dogwood, willow. And we found two benefits. One is they seem to just do better together. And the second one is they're more resistant to browsing. If you've got a straight row of cottonwoods, uh, an elk or a, a cow will go right down that row and take them all. If you've got a clump of 15, they'll just work around the edges and you'll have some survivability. So uh, look at family planting. You know, look at putting them back in the site the way they occur naturally. It was family planting, not family planning. Family planting. <laughs> I have one small thing to what Rick was saying is that we there are mulch mats that are available if you if you want to plant if you have an area that you can't get machinery in and you want to use individual mats uh, they are available that would do the same same thing have the same benefits. Hmm. How about the remote sites? Any questions out there? Well, let's take some more from Legrand then. Uh, Rick, uh, have you had much success with uh, uh, farm and ranch owners with with this uh, this series of uh, arguments and uh, you know opportunities and advantages of aspen and cottonwood? Well, uh, the the answer is yes, um, and 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 but but it's a you know how how do you quantify that? Oftentimes, as human beings, we want to see everything change overnight. 100%, uh, and, and as human beings, oftentimes it, it takes us a long time to get to a certain place, and so sometimes it takes us a little while to, to change our thinking. Um, my personality is, is such that if you show me, uh, and, and if you can show me, and I can touch it, and I can see it, and I can feel it, and I know it's there, then I'll give it a shot. Uh, and, but, you know, some things just don't change overnight. But what we do see, we don't see whole scale changes, but what we do see is, is people trying a little bit at a time. And as they have incremental success, they try more. The real level of success is not going to probably come from government programs uh, or, or laws ramming things down people's throat, but individual landowners doing things and other landowners looking over the fences and going, well, Fred, now what are you doing over there today? And, and, and I've had several. The, the, we, we're bordered by seven, seven different landowners, and at least two of them, uh, as soon as we get the solar pump set up, want to come over and 
see how come our trees are growing and in the past they haven't had much luck growing theirs out there. Uh, you know, we've had to go, we've had to do a lot of things, but a lot of that is looking over the fence and seeing what's taking place. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a uh, concern that, you know, government's out there trying to take over. And so there's a lot of skepticism when the government's in there trying to tell you how to do things. But when your fellow rancher's doing it, your fellow farmer, and it's working out for them, then, then people can buy into that. And, um, you know, that's where we got some of our ideas. And, uh, and I think that's why some of these tours are extremely valuable out onto the private lands. Uh, because those are the people that uh, they haven't got huge million dollar budgets to try to make things work. They got to work it off a of shoestring. And if you can do it off of there and make it work, then you probably got something. And so uh, the answer to your question is yes, not whole scale overnight, but incrementally uh, folks are doing some things. More questions? Go ahead. Rick, you mentioned uh, fee photography. What kind of fee are we talking about? <laughs> I didn't, uh, this didn't come from the horse's mouth. But the figure I heard on one of the, uh, one of the opportunities in, in, in south of here was in the neighborhood of three to $500 a day. Uh, for the opportunity to basically have access onto land and photograph large deer and elk and wildlife and aspens and things like this. Um, that's kind of shocking, but if you try to, if you try to uh, load the family up and go to, go to Yellowstone to see the same sort of thing and somehow try to squeeze a spot in between everybody else taking pictures, uh, that's not too bad, especially if a, for a professional photographer that might make a significant amount of money off some of those pictures. So um, again, you know, there's some, there's some opportunities there. Questions from the remote sites? Hmm. Quiet out there. I hope the audio bridge is up. Can, can somebody let us know if the audio bridge is up out there? In the meantime, maybe somebody has... Bill, this is the Seneca School, and we're here. Oh, good for you. <laughs> John Dan here. Great. Everybody else there? Is Prineville there tonight? How about Enterprise? Okay. This is John Day. I got a question for Paul. Okay, go ahead. Hi, hey, Paul. This is Greg Whipple. Um, well, when Greg. you're cutting back on the existing aspen stands, uh, what kind of openings are either canopy closure, density, or whatever, um, have you been using? It's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. You're talking, the question relates to how, with the size of the gaps for regenerating the stands. I don't know. Uh, I've thought, we thought, just talked about that, and we were thinking that perhaps something like uh, a tree height might be enough um, by it creating creating gaps that were about a tree height or maybe a, a height and a half for a, a, a minimum size might, might work, but I don't really know. I don't have any experience in doing that. I know that we're trying, uh, not uh, that OSU is trying some kind of innovative things down in Corvallis and Mac Forest where they're using this gappy, uh, uh, gappy, clumpy, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Sounds official. It's very official. <laughs> but what they're, what they're trying to do is they're creating uh, the different sized gaps in the forest to see if they can get natural regeneration. They're also planting some of those uh, for you know, more, uh, or forests that are, have more diversity for wildlife and so on. There's a, they've got a social um, uh, part to it where they're trying to get uh, people's perceptions of you know, how they feel about those kinds of um, uh, stands aesthetically and so on, uh, but also looking at the wildlife and the timber production. But those, those gaps are, are about uh, a tree height. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from remote sites? More from Legrand. Are we winding down, folks? Go ahead, Jim. I have a question for Otis. Uh, same question I asked Rick about <laughs> the BLM. Uh, how are 
perceptive is a, is a line off, you know, a line off for the management types. And the BLM to, to really this kind of a intensive focus and uh, spending on combat management. They're real receptive, and they've been really encouraging as far as finding some shortcuts and some cheaper ways of doing business. Uh, the uh, uh, cut and poke method of cottonwood, go cut a limb off and stick it in the, in the ground so its feet's wet, is pretty cheap compared to, to uh, taking a cutting and propagating, you know, uh, getting a root callus, putting it in the bare nursery and bringing it back into the field. And with aspen, gathering seed yourself, uh, something as simple as scattering aspen seed on the upper part of an exclosure and letting it wash down, find its own place. Uh, there's some limiting factors. Uh, aspen and cottonwood seed is very uh, uh, subject to exposure. It's real, it's real sensitive seed, so you got to know all about that. Uh, some new fencing methods for exclusion of uh, livestock into your mother plantation or your, your area where you want to get plant material is big enough to stand those kinds of pressures. You know, the ribbon fencing they're doing, electric fencing, et cetera. So they're real supportive, and they're real supportive of, uh, there's not a lot of money out there to do this. And they're real supportive of innovative ways to do this, you know, repairing pastures, changing grazing systems to support this kind of effort. And we're getting, uh, we've got enough facts and figures to show downstream water users that we can store a lot more water on the upper part of the watershed than we could before. And so that gets us a lot of support from those kind of people. Paul, I have a question for you. Were those figures that you used, were they those realistic figures for the value of the cottonwood? They're close. It depends on, on, on the market mm -hmm. and timing, for example. I mean, those are all prices that have we've seen in the past. Whether they're there today or not, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But because they do fluctuate quite a bit annually throughout the year, uh, different years, uh, during the season sometimes. Uh, but those are pretty close. Mm -hmm. Very, very low prices, values, yeah. unless you have a lot of volume. Well, part of it is uh, Boise Cascade, for example, is, has been paying about, you know, I think I can say this, uh, close to, th to $32 per ton uh, mm -hmm. at times for cottonwood. But that's delivered <coughs> to Umatilla, and you've got quite a, a uh, hauling cost involved mm -hmm. in that. And the hauling cost I used was, a, was for a 100-mile round trip. Well. Umatilla is farther than that, so your trucking costs are going to be higher. Mm -hmm. And so you could come out a negative pretty easily on that $32. Mm -hmm. But they're putting in a new digester <coughs> over there, when they, according to the folks I've talked to. And once they do that, they can, they can uh, use the cottonwood for higher value paper, and the, cost, and the price will go up. And so then it becomes more attractive. Mm -hmm. Yes, Rick. Bill, along with that, um, you know, there, 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 there's obviously a large process that takes place in order to, uh, to harvest um, trees, whether they be cottonwoods or whatever. And as a landowner makes a decision to do that, especially where there's not a lot of value, hard cash dollars, uh, they can't afford to have too many things go wrong during the harvesting operations. And so if, if you don't pick the timing right, uh, if you don't judiciously select the right person with the right equipment to do the job, by the time some of that heavy equipment mashes two or three culverts, a mess gets left out there, um, fences get torn down, and a few other things, uh, that even more substantially uh, is a disincentive to, to what everybody should do. And, and so, you know, if you are going to engage in that, and there's certainly a lot of good reasons to do that, um, you know, make sure that you've got a pretty good handle on the process that's going to take place, because mm -hmm. it's just not something that magically happens. There's big machines and things taking place out there, and it can be done right and done very well as long as it's managed carefully. Mm -hmm. But you don't have a lot of money to play with if something goes wrong to you know to recover damage from. Mm -hmm. Something you might look at <coughs> is uh, taking your cottonwood or aspen volume. And if you want to harvest the stand to encourage suckering so you can collect that material and move it to other places on your property, you might look at large woody material. We found a really good cheap way to slow the stream down to bring that stream back up. It, as it comes up, the water table comes with it. So if you have an incised stream, one that's down there four to six feet, eight feet, and you want to bring that up and, and spread out your water table and have more area for cottonwoods and aspen or whatever, take your uh, uh, trunks and large limbs and just fill that watershed up. 
you know, with large-witted material, it really sounds crazy and looks crazy. But we've had phenomenal success with just filling streams up with large-witted material, and then nature moves it around as the flood comes down, and you find tremendous accumulations of soil, the stream coming up really fast, and, and the water table rising and spreading out. So if you want to increase your, your water storage on your place, you know, or right out in your field, you know, you can use that material as, as large woody debris. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing about cottonwood aspen <coughs> strips along your streams that I read is they've got studies that show that up to 80% of the runoff from your fields, nutrients, uh, farm chemicals can be trapped by these strips. Mm -hmm. which is really important these days when we're dealing with water quality so much. That's good. Any other questions from remote sites? Paul had another comment here relating just, to that. Just briefly, just to follow up a little bit with what Rick was saying, and what I, what I wanted to say was that the logging in general, uh, you know, if you ask somebody about logging costs, they can give you you know, it varies quite a bit, actually. It depends on the terrain, how steep the ground is. It depends on just a lot of things. But one thing about these cottonwood strips is it's generally a little uh, more expensive to log them because you have to, you, you have to change your landings more often than you would on a, in, a, in a forest stand. So that's something that's, that's going to come up that could even uh, erode your profit uh, even a little bit more. Mm -hmm. and, and the other point was that we do have, if, if people are interested in, you know, in, in selling logs and timber, uh, we do have information on how to go, you know, some steps to go through so you prevent these disasters that, that might occur um, in the woods. Uh, you know, we've got two or three different publications, plus one on contracts, too, that, hmm. that uh, would help forge an understanding between the logger and the landowner. So. Any other questions from Legrand? How about remote sites? Last chance. Um, from Baker City, uh, on the uh, mat, is it is that better to use the mat than uh, some chemical like Vespa or something? I'll let I'll let Paul maybe ultimately answer that. But some of the chemicals that we wind up <coughs> utilizing in the piney woods for the uh, conifers. You've got to be real careful on the on the deciduous and the broad leaves because some of those, uh, uh, you know, could uh, definitely harm those. I think if you're going to do that, you'd need to very carefully check the labeling on that as well as check with maybe somebody that's had experience with that. And, and Paul, you might want to follow up on that a little bit. Well, frankly, I personally haven't had a lot of experience in using herbicides on hardwoods, and, and Rick is right. You need to be uh, very careful and read the label and so on. There are some, though, that are registered for hardwoods. Um, and one of them is Fusillade. There's a couple of others. Uh, but my recommendation would be, though they can be very expensive. And to say one thing is better than another, I can't tell you what the cost per acre is uh, or per tree it might be for some of these herbicides that are used on, on hardwoods. Uh, but I do know the mats are relatively expensive on a per tree basis. And, but, you know, the main idea is, uh, you know, you have to look at the economics. You also have to look at uh, the, the benefit from, from using that particular technique for meeting your objective for weed control. How effective is it? Uh, the risks involved in, in using this, whatever it, it might be, in terms of damaging your, your crop, you know, in this case, hardwoods. Uh, I just think there's a lot of options, and, and to say one is best, better than the other, it kind of depends on the landowner's uh, objective, I guess, and, and what they and how they want to go about it. But certainly, if you're interested in getting recommendations for herbicides and what they cost for this kind of work, uh, you can I can find out. Uh, give me a call, and I can I can let you know. Uh, and same with the mats and, and other kinds of options you might have in terms of cost. One thing you might look at is is be really <coughs> careful about about what your problem is. A lot of times we look at a situation and we think that the problem is moisture stress and it's temperature. And, and so you need to have somebody come out and look at your problem and see exactly what the situation is because you don't want to treat a situation that's not going to help you. It's going to cost money, it's going to cost time, and it may cost your plant. So have somebody come out and look at it if you don't know what's going on and say, what do you think is happening here? 
and uh, get a couple of opinions, and that'll help guide you what direction to go as far as treatment. Yeah, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. One of the other things with, with herbicides that some folks have done, and, and this might be more practical, especially to hardwoods, is pre-treating the site maybe oftentimes a year before uh, or a season before you actually plant. Uh, uh, one of the things I've seen, if you do that, uh, you need to get some sort of marking, uh, little wire flags or something the elk isn't going to pull up or whatever, because when you go to plant in the spring, that ground looks dead just like everything else beside it. And, uh, and you don't actually see that until it starts to green up, so it'll help you. But some of those folks are actually pre-treating uh, little spots all over the landscape, maybe uh, in the fall, uh, and then plant it in the spring. And if, if, if herbicide is the choice you decide to go and those plants are somewhat susceptible, that might be a viable option. Uh, get your grass killed, but uh, um, you know, not have the residue there that'll hurt your little trees. One thing you look at also is, is we had some really good success with scalping and putting cottonwood in and and then we planted these eight footers and we were so proud of ourselves. We had wonderful success and they looked phenomenal. And then we came back after the first fall and deer had rubbed the bark totally off all of them. Not some, all of them. They had gone down. And so what we found out was you can take a strip of burlap and just staple it and wrap mm. it around that area they like to rub and they don't do it. Mm. So you're going to have to keep up with this all through the life of the plant. It's a whole new adventure for all of us is what it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Any other questions? Go ahead. You mentioned deer. What about porcupines? Oh yeah, porcupines are quite fond of aspen and cottonwood bark. And uh, I don't know. Uh, we haven't had that problem yet. So I think the solution is probably uh, trapping and releasing the offender or eliminating the offender. Mm -hmm. They tend to hang in the same area and work on all the trees. Any other, other, go ahead. Another animal damage uh, critter you might watch out for are meadow voles. Don't they, they like to chew on at the base of the, not only conifers, but, but hardwoods too. Okay. Any other questions for re remote sites? Hearing none, I'd like to uh, have you help me welcome or thank these guys for their presentations. Right, we're gonna go home and go to bed. <laughs>